Thanks everyone for uh, joining us. I'm uh, obviously joined by the Minister for Education, Alan Tudge, uh, by uh, the Head of Operation COVID Shield, Lieutenant General Fruin, uh, and the Chief Medical Officer of Australia, Professor Paul Kelly. Uh, we're following up uh, uh, on the uh, Prime Minister's announcement in relation to the release of the Australian Technical Advisory Group on immunisation advice with regards to the vaccination of children 12 to 15 year olds, as well as an update on uh, uh, the national rollout. Um, in particular, uh, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation uh, has uh, considered and recommended that Pfizer be made available to all children 12 to 15 years of age. Um, we are following their advice and uh, following the sequencing that they have suggested. And as a consequence of that, uh, we will open up bookings for vaccinations as of the 13th of September for all children aged 12 to 15. Uh, this builds on the fact that since uh, August the 9th, we have opened up vaccinations for immunocompromised children, uh, children with uh, uh, Indigenous heritage and uh, children in remote communities, as well as the addition of those on the NDIS subsequently. Um, importantly, uh, what that means is that we're in a position to uh, ensure that all children and all families who seek their children uh, to be vaccinated between the ages of 12 to 15 will be able to do so this year. Uh, we're in a position to uh, uh, move uh, from the 13th uh, on the basis of the advice, um, and that's a carefully sequenced plan. We're opening up, as you know, uh, for 16 to 39-year-olds as of uh, Monday. Uh, so that's a very important step and uh, some states and territories have already done that and we thank them and uh, recognise that and we'll continue to work with all of the states and territories on that front. In addition to that, uh, if um, the Australian Technical Advisory Group and the TGA approve the uh, provision of Moderna uh, for 12 to 18 year olds, we will also make that available. Um, these vaccines, and General Fruin will go into more detail on this, uh, will be available through the usual channels. Um, in particular, uh, general practices, uh, Aboriginal community controlled health organisations, Commonwealth vaccination clinics, Moderna up through uh, the uh, pharmacies. And in addition to that, as states and territories are in a position, uh, they will make uh, these vaccines available through both state vaccination clinics and where they choose to run school-based programs through school-based programs. So I think that's an extremely important next step in the plan and the rollout program. Uh, in relation to the actual progress of the program, um, 307,000 vaccinations uh, yesterday. Uh, in particular, uh, what we're seeing is uh, now almost 18.4 million vaccinations nationally that have occurred. And uh, of note is that primary care has now delivered over 10 million vaccinations. So to our GPs and our pharmacists, to those, those in Aboriginal community controlled health organisations, and in particular uh, to our Commonwealth vaccination clinics, I just want to say thank you. You're doing an amazing job. The um, uh, first doses are at 56% or 11.55 million. There's a very important point here, which uh, I think we're now in a position to reflect upon. Uh, in order to achieve the 70% mark, uh, we need to have 14.5 million Australians vaccinated. Another 3 million Australians to get to the first dose 70% mark. Uh, in order to achieve the 80% mark, we need to have approximately 16.5 million uh, or Australians 16 plus vaccinated. So that's less than 5 million to go from where we are in order to achieve the 80% first dose mark. And of course, the second doses follow that. But that is a sign that we are closing, that these goals are within sight. The capacity to achieve that 80% is real and present. And we see that with what we've already been able to do as a nation with regards to our different age groups. Our over 50s are almost at the 80% mark for first doses, 77.2%. Our over 60s are over that 80% threshold. 
at 82.1%, and the over 70s are well over that threshold at 86.6%. So these things are happening on a grand scale. In, in one week, almost 1.9 million vaccinations. And so when you see that we need less than 5 million more first vaccinations to pass that 80% mark, we can see that these goals are attainable, in sight, and closer every single day. So I think those are important signs of hope for Australia. Alan? Well, thanks, Greg. This uh, decision to open up Pfizer to the 15 to, from the, for the 12 to 15-year-olds is clearly a very important decision, and it really provides that extra protection and peace of mind to, to kids, to parents, and to teachers. And particularly as we look to reopen uh, schools in, in New South Wales, the ACT in Victoria, where they have been closed. And I want to particularly make reference to the Atagi advice and on, on the third page, where it refers to the fact that vaccinating adolescents is anticipated to reduce disruption to their education by preventing disease and reducing p potential transmission and outbreaks in schools. It also goes on to say that a reduction in the number and severity of outbreaks resulting in school closures and extensive public health interventions would also likely reduce disruption to parents and family work with clear economic benefits. So this will make a significant difference in terms of providing that peace of mind um, and ensuring that schools can again be reopened and ensure that in ensuring that those schools which are already open can stay open. Now, also note that this becomes available on the 13th of September uh, for those 12 to 15 year olds. So I certainly encourage all families to take advantage of that. It's a week before school holidays begin in, in the larger states on the Eastern Seaboard, um, just a couple of weeks before the school holidays begin in, in Western Australia. Um, that also provides, of course, an opportunity to take your, take your child down and get, get them vaccinated. I'll just also, while I'm here, just note that uh, the New South Wales government has announced their school reopening plan today. And I want to commend the New South Wales government for that plan. What I think it does is provides confidence and certainty for parents and students, um, that they can see that light on the horizon. They know when the schools are going to be open. They can look forward to that time and they can plan accordingly. And of course, I would love to see similar confidence and certainty being able to be provided to Victorian and ACT parents as well, to, in order to uh, um, give them that peace of mind that schools can be opened, be opened safely, and uh, for kids to be able to get back to school. You know, getting back to school is just so important for kids. You know, the mental health consequences of children not being at school has just been devastating. Um, we know that from the official statistics in terms of the presentations to um, whether it be to headspace centres or to Kids Lifeline, almost the doubling of the number of calls to the Butterfly Foundations, which deal with eating disorders, which is such an insidious, insidious condition. And if we can get these schools back open again, um, we do so safely, get the community activities open again and do that safely, then we can help address some of those mental health issues and of course enhance kids learning as well. So I welcome the New South Wales plan and look forward to a similar plan being announced by Victoria. General. Thank you, Ministers. Look, momentum in the rollout continues to build. We have additional points of presence coming online, additional GPs uh, administering Pfizer. Uh, soon we'll have the pharmacy network uh, administering uh, Moderna as well. Um, and the numbers continue to grow, which is great. And this uh, inclusion of the 12 to 15 year olds today is another important step in the program. Uh, we have already uh, made arrangements to have 16 to 19 year olds included from Monday. Uh, and of course, previously we have made uh, Pfizer available to the 12 to 15 year olds with other uh, either underlying conditions, uh, indigenous kids uh, and kids in remote and regional areas. So. Uh, these 12 to 15 year olds now will broadly be able to make bookings from uh, the middle of next month. Uh, I encourage everybody to get along, uh, parents, to get your kids uh, booked in and to uh, have a bit of patience uh, while 
uh, you get bookings as you can, but uh, we look forward to getting the 12 to 15 year olds through the door. Thank and you. And Paul. Thanks, Minister. So, uh, of course, the situation in Australia has, is, is different wherever you're living today. Uh, here in the ACT, we're in lockdown, same throughout New South Wales and Victoria. Schools are closed. Uh, so this is a really important announcement today. We know that, that the outbreaks that are occurring in those three jurisdictions do include a proportion of children. The proportion is a bit higher than last year, partly because of the protective effect of vaccination in older, in older cohorts, in the adults. So uh, one, a wonderful decision by Atagi, and we'll follow through with that plan to vaccinate children in, in that age group. An important point to make about children and COVID, uh, whilst the numbers are there and we're finding cases, most of those are in family clusters. Uh, some of them have been uh, related to school clusters but almost entirely the, the disease in children is much less severe than it is in adults. Um, so that's an important component. We have seen some hospitalisations in that age group. Uh, most of those in New, are, have been in New South Wales and most of those have been for social reasons rather than because they are severely sick. But, but there will be and there has been some, uh, some uh, more serious cases of COVID in those age groups. So vaccination, very important. Um, the question uh, might come that why, why has this been uh, not been announced earlier? I think it's been very important that ATAGI has looked at that risk and benefits uh, analysis of vaccination. Uh, Minister Tudge has mentioned some of those wider benefits for society. Um, there, there has been uh, some concerns about side effects in younger people for mRNA vaccines, particularly related to myocarditis and pericarditis. So the heart muscle and the surrounds of the heart muscle can get some inflammation. Uh, there have been reports from overseas of that happening, particularly in young males. Um, but they, ATAGI has done their due diligence in relation to that and have made that decision, as they always do, looking at risk and benefit, and it's fallen on the side of benefit. And so we will push ahead based on that advice in rolling out that, uh, that um, uh, um, program for adolescents. In the meantime, very importantly, the, the parents and teachers are being protected by that, uh, that announcement of, of increasing the availability of Pfizer um, to that 16 uh, to um, 39 age group. So they have that secondary effect. This will add to that uh, when it becomes available. Thank you, okay. Minister. So look, I'll uh, start over here uh, with Fee and then work across the room. Minister, we're hearing reports from overseas of kids under 12 ending up in ICU. Um, obviously that age group can't be vaccinated. What would you say to parents in Australia who have kids in that age group who are worried? Sure. So two things and then I'll, I'll turn to Paul. Uh, the best way to protect your child is to be vaccinated yourself. We know that uh, most children uh, who do develop uh, COVID catch it within the household environment from an adult. And so the best way to protect your child is to be vaccinated yourself. Secondly, as we've had uh, international evidence, we've continued to open up to different age groups. Uh, down to 16 year olds and now down to 12 to 15 year olds. Um, and uh, as there are trials and as there are applications, uh, we'll consider those. I'm not aware of, uh, of any programs that are underway for children under 12, but I think Paul is best placed to anybody in Australia to address that. Um, thanks, Minister. So, uh, the Minister is quite correct. There's nowhere in the world that has a program for, for um, uh, vaccinating children under the age of 12. There are clinical trials uh, right down to a very young age happening in different countries, and we'll be watching those very carefully. I spoke to the head of the TGA this week, uh, Professor Skerritt, to ask what the latest uh, on that was, and he affirmed that no, no regulator in the world uh, has received data in relation to under 12s. Uh, so that we have to rely on that secondary effect, as the minister said. Parents, please get vaccinated. These older siblings now from, from mid-September will also be part of that cocooning effect of protection. Teachers, please get vaccinated. Uh, anyone who has anything to do with young kids, please get vaccinated. I think I've made my point clear. Now's the time to make that appointment and get that vaccination started. Okay. Paul? The, the Atari advice says that 12 to 15 year olds are a lower priority than young adults who, who might be circulating more in the community and older Australians. And it notes that we still have constrained supplies. So, so two questions. Uh, will the 13 September start date 
uh, be enough to ensure that the 12 to 15s don't crowd out young adults from getting appointments? And secondly, will you follow their advice and give older Australians a choice of vaccine so that some uh, AstraZeneca hesitant uh, older people can get Pfizer before a 12 to 15 year old? Sure. So uh, two things. Uh, firstly, uh, we have followed Targi's advice, which does explain exactly that sequencing. Your, yours is a very fair question, and uh, I'll let uh, General Fruin address the, uh, the capacity. Uh, but uh, we've based the date of the 13th on the ability uh, to uh, ensure that we have the commencement of the 16 to 39 year old program. Uh, we've also already seen significant vaccinations in 16 to 39 year olds around the country through different state based programs, through uh, the fact of vocational roles um, or through the fact of vulnerability. Um, the uh, other thing in, uh, in relation to this, uh, we said from the outset uh, that we have whole of population uh, access to vaccines. We've already seen extraordinary levels uh, of vaccination amongst our older Australians. I think I mentioned just before that it's 77% uh, uh, for the 50 plus, 82% for the 60 plus and 86.6%. And uh, those figures are increasing uh, daily. I, I follow the over 60s and over 70s on a daily basis. The over 60s are increasing by about 0.4% a day. The over 70s are increasing by about 0.3% a day. So uh, what we're seeing is strong, continuous demand, uh, and uh, we'll provide more advice on that later, but we've always said there would be whole of population access um, during the course of the year. So we've followed a target advice to the letter. I don't know, JJ, if you wanted to add anything? Sure, Minister. Thanks. So look, we've been balancing uh, risk supply and the health advice in the prioritisation. So the minister just spoken to the very good coverage rates we've got in the most vulnerable, the over 70s and the over 60s, above 80% first dosing. Um, since then, we've had the Doherty modelling now, which has uh, raised the prominence of the high transmissibility groups. So we've worked within supply to bring in the 16 to 39 year olds now as an additional priority group. Um, as I've mentioned, we've already focused on the most vulnerable and the 12 to 15-year-olds in relation to the ATAGI advice that was provided that, on that earlier. Uh, and in this sequencing now, we have been balancing the additional points of presence that I've spoken about, uh, the additional uh, uh, vaccines that we have coming online. And we have got in October the, the very large amounts of Pfizer that are coming. So bookings from the middle of uh, next month, from the 13th, we think will we'll sit uh, very well with the available vaccines at that stage. And we've deliberately sequenced this to make sure um, that we do give people the best access uh, in the best and okay. most appropriate sequence. Sarah. Um, just a couple of questions. One on the 12 to 15 um, year old age group. Do we have any idea if there's much hesitancy from parents? We obviously have a lot of data regarding hesitancy of different age groups. Do we know how parents are feeling about giving 12 to 15 year olds a jab? And on school-based vaccination programs, we obviously have this 7 September 13 date. Are we expecting schools at that point to be already giving out jabs to kids or is it in a few months? And is that very much between the states and territories and the school or is other feds involved? Sure, so what we have developed is a youth vaccination program. And the youth vaccination program covers kids from 12 to 19. The 16 to 19s, their eligibility starts from Monday. And across uh, the various jurisdictions, some of those kids have already been getting vaccinated. So I know in uh, a couple of the states, they've been taking year 12s uh, in that 16 to 19 range to state hubs and, and the like. Uh, the, so we're looking at school kids. We're looking at kids in care circumstances, out of home care sometimes. We're looking at uh, youth that are in detention. We're looking at disadvantaged kids who might be homeless and, and so on. So we're looking at that broad spectrum. The school-based programs, we will work in consultation with the states and territories, of course, when it comes to private and independent schools, that's a federal responsibility. The states have responsibility for the state school systems. Some things are already happening. There will be uh, more comprehensive programs, more targeted programs, uh, in-reach type programs into some of these facilities. Uh, it won't all start on the 13th, no. Some stuff already happening, but you'll see these programs taking shape over the sort of next month or so. Okay. Um, Minister? I, I haven't seen any figures on those. Uh, 
in COVID outbreak in that community, Will Kenya, there's no ventilator in that community. What efforts are being made to boost capacity to deal with that outbreak and do field hospitals need to be set up? Sure. On field hospital, hospitals, Paul? Um, so firstly, Will Kenya, um, there was a, an event, a, an, unfortunately a funeral, where there were a lot of uh, a large large proportion of this small town were at, the, at this event. So uh, it appears that m many people have been affected at that event. So uh, there is a lot of work going on in Wilcannia right now, literally door to door um, uh, engagement with the community. It's a, it's a fantastic uh, example of collaboration between the New South Wales State Government, the local health district, the Royal Flying Doctor Service, an OSMAT team on the ground right now offering door-to-door -door vaccination and or testing. Uh, and so all of these things are working in concert. Uh, so um, whilst there may not be a, a ventilator in town, but there are ventilators, of course, in Broken Hill and from Broken Hill to other areas if required. But the most important thing now is testing, tracing, isolation, quarantine and vaccination. I think Paul's covered it. Richard? Thanks. Um, Minister Tudge said before that vaccinations in 15 year olds will help disrupt the transmission of COVID in schools. Obviously, we're not going to have vaccinations for kids under the age of 12 for quite some time, given the trials and all that sort of thing. So what sort of a plan is there in place to keep kids in school into next year when we can't vaccinate those primary school kids? What other sort of mitigation processes are in place? And also to Professor Kelly, could you just explain a bit more about the Atagi process, why it's taken them a month? from the medical regulator approving the vaccine for those kids, for them to decide for it to be used for those Can I say something on ATAGI first, and then I'll turn to Paul and Alan, um, respectively. Um, in terms of ATAGI, um, when I first announced the uh, approval by the TGA, um, I indicated that they would do this in two phases. Uh, one was for immunocompromised children, and we expected within a week that they would be able to provide that advice, and they did. Um, and then we also indicated the latter half of August was the time frame because they wanted to look at emerging international data. So it's entirely consistent with uh, the very thing that ATAGI advised us and which I announced uh, just over a month it's ago. It's a bit confusing for people for the medical regulator to say it's OK, but then we have to wait for ATAGI. So it's, it's a, it is a double green light process in Australia. Protecting our kids uh, is absolutely fundamental. And at the heart of that is not only the medical work to ensure that it's safe, but the confidence of the public that the best medical regulators in the world, in our view, the, the TGA and advisory body ATAGI, have worked together to provide that reassurance. And uh, that is actually, to, to go to Sarah's point, the strongest defence against hesitancy, to know that the best medical regulators in the world have considered this and found it to be safe and effective, Paul. Um, thanks, Minister. And just to, 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 to explain the difference between TGA and, and ATAGI, so the TGA advice was based on three things. They always look at the quality of the, of the vaccine itself, the, the way it's been manufactured and making sure that that is high quality. They look at effectiveness, uh, does it work? Uh, and finally, safety. Uh, so those three things, they got the tick. Um, the next part of that process for our vaccination programs, and this is the same for all vaccinations, not just for COVID vaccinations, ATAGI, our, our medical expert group that, that is advised, uh, advises the minister, appointed by the minister for that task, uh, looks at that risk and benefit equation. So we've got familiar with that in the last few months in relation to other, other uh, vaccinations and other age groups. Uh, and this was a, an important part of the consideration for children, uh, and particularly in relation to this myocarditis uh, issue. So they've been able to look at what's happened in the US and other places uh, in, in the real world. Uh, and the other question was about schools and, and staying safe. Minister, do you want to talk to that, or shall I start? You can start if you want. Yeah. Um, so uh, in terms of, uh, of school safety, so uh, the AHPPC, the other expert panel in, in this uh, space that I chair, um, uh, did look at schools last year in relation to keeping schools open or when they should close or how they should reopen in relation to the original virus that we were faced with at that time. Uh, we've twice this year looked at it again in relation to the alpha strain, now to the delta strain. We have some new things to consider now in relation to something that will protect the kids, which is the which is this vaccination program, and so that's work that's that is being undertaken uh, at the moment. And I'll pass to Minister Tudge. If there's anything else you would like to add? Um, I'll just simply add that the the best way of protecting kids is for all adults to be vaccinated as well, and that's what the Doherty advice was to prevent the transmission. 
and it was suggesting we have just minimal disruption once we get to 70 to 80 per cent vaccination rate, and that means that schools can be open then. Um, for primary aged kids, I'm not aware that uh, uh, a vaccine has been approved for primary aged kids anywhere in the world, um, but I'm aware that the, um, and again look to the Chief Medical Officer here, that while some primary aged kids can get the virus, the likelihood of them getting very sick is low compared to other segments of the population. But, but they can still spread it to like their parents, their other friends, you know, and, there's still a risk of it spreading in primary schools, so how are we going to reduce that risk and really keep them open? And, and, and hence the overall vaccination rate being important, which we've been stressing for a very long time now. And we want to get the schools back open again. We have to get the schools back open again, not just so that their learning isn't disrupted, but so that their social interactions can occur for their mental well-being. I mean, both Greg and I are from Melbourne, and we would get calls into our electorate offices every single day, emails every single day about from parents who are in distress, from young children. I just had a report this morning um, from a mother with a nine-year-old child who has now got suicidal thoughts because she hasn't been able to see her, her, her friends for so long um, and isn't seeing hope on the horizon. So we are providing that hope today, and we've been providing that hope with the national plan that once we get to that 70% figure, once we get to that 80% figure, the communities can be open again. We can to be back to normal again where there aren't the outbreaks. And then today, with the 12 to 15 year olds being able to be vaccinated, it's just that extra peace of mind Minister. for the kids, for the parents and for the teachers. Um, uh, just on the 12 to 15 year olds, it's open on the 13th of September. When do you expect the first vaccine will actually take place for that age group? And just picking up on something the General said earlier about state versus private education, should parents be concerned that their child might have different access to a vaccine depending on whether they go to a state school or a private school? Sure. So firstly, in relation to uh, vaccinations, uh, so bookings uh, commence of the, uh, as of the 13th of September and vaccinations can commence as of the 13th of September. So um, what we'll see is, uh, thanks to the work of JJ and his team, uh, the work that we're doing every night, I promise you, every night uh, around the world. Um, we're in a, a strong position um, with the bookings we've already got, with the orders we already have, but as the Prime Minister indicated, uh, making very good progress on other bring forwards. So Australia is in a strong position with vaccines, um, not just Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca is not uh, for uh, recommended for these children in these age groups, uh, but most significantly, um, and nor is it available, it's 18 plus, uh, but most significantly, a large proportion of the population are vaccinated, more vaccines coming, uh, and therefore the capacity. So it will be as each uh, uh, as each provider is in a position to uh, make them available, we're very confident there'll be large numbers of vaccines available on the difference between uh, schools. Remembering this, the primary vaccination network is the existing vaccination network. GPs, pharmacies, Commonwealth clinics, state clinics, do not wait for a school program. If you can have your child vaccinated, get them vaccinated. Do not wait for a school program because different schools will be at different places. I'll have uh, oh no, I think we've we, we pretty much covered uh, it. Quick question. Up the back. Um, Craig Kelly, Hello. I just want to give you, uh, Professor Kelly, a chance to uh, confirm or refute. Craig Kelly has sent out a, a series of group emails talking about a groundbreaking study from Oxford University saying now vaccines, while uh, moderating symptoms at first, the jab allows a higher viral load in the nose, which then creates super spreaders. Is there any evidence of those who have been vaccinated becoming super spreaders and I would wonder if that's the case when you've got a large vaccinated population in Western Australia and they currently have no cases. So Professor Kelly, is there any evidence of those who've been vaccinated having a higher viral load in the nose and becoming super spreaders or is it nonsense? Um, so uh, <coughs> uh, I won't go to that second part, but the first part, um, look, I, I'm not aware of that particular study. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, look for it uh, after this. Um, what I can say, and, and I've said often here, is that it's, there, there are uh, issues related to, to infectious diseases and how they're spread. It's the way people 
uh, move about and how they interact. There are people issues. There are virus issues. Uh, and, and there's the environment in which uh, the virus and, and people live. Uh, so all of those things are very much related to super spreader events. We're seeing super spreader events, so we have seen those from the beginning. Um, but, but what the influence of, of vaccination on that is, and, 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 terms, and particularly how much virus is in the nose, would be potentially part of it, but it's not the major part. I think the, the, the key message I have is vaccination is safe, effective, and really, really important for us in relation to reopening Australia. And as the Minister has said, uh, that's the hopeful message. We are moving towards that. Sorry? Could it be spreading the virus? Uh, it wouldn't be spreading the virus, no. Uh, I mean, the, the only thing I could imagine, just thinking, uh, thinking here now, is that uh, if people are asymptomatic and they have, uh, and the, that's more likely if you've been vaccinated, then it could spread. But I don't think it's a it's it's a reason to not get vaccinated, uh, and so quite the opposite. I'll, I'll finish mm. on this um, because both Paul and JJ, uh, sorry, Paul and JJ, have to brief the Prime Minister before the National Cabinet. Uh, the simple answer is that vaccines. Save, save lives and protect lives. Vaccines save lives and protect lives, and they are doing that. And we see that with the dramatically different outcomes in aged care in New South Wales as opposed to Victoria. So the message to Australians is thank you. Over uh, 18.4 million vaccinations, each one of those is saving lives and protecting lives of the individual and of the community. And uh, so as you're eligible, please come forward to be vaccinated. Do not wait. It can save your life. It can protect your life. Thank you very much.